All right, folks, let's hop into our first article, which is nano-engineered armor, or shields. And it's coming out of uh, research from MIT, Caltech, and ETH Zurich. Uh, the lead researcher on it is named Carlos Portela. And basically what they're doing is creating a lightweight armor that provides a similar or even better level of protection as steel, Kevlar, aluminum, all these other impact-resistant materials that we use to armor spacecraft. We use them to protect human beings, and they're using carbon to do it. This is and actually... Sorry, I didn't really cut you. I was just going to say, this is kind of a good connection to uh, a, a previous episode we had recently where we were talking about space trash and how we like really need armoring to stop it from impacting spacecrafts. This sounds like it would be a great application for that. Yeah, well, and there's a lot of places where you want to armor something, and almost every single time you want it to be lighter and more flexible. Mm -hmm. And that's what they think they can achieve with this carbon material. And, you know, carbon is, you know, in some forms it's diamond, in some forms it's graphene, but, you know, in those forms it is one of the strongest materials known to man. So they're trying to find a way to use this strength found in carbon and use that as an impact resistant material to armor and protect the things that we care about. Um, Makes and sense. So the way that they did it is basically by 3D printing a polymer that's similar to carbon uh, using a technique called lithography and then oh. they cure it in a, in a furnace and turn it into this carbon, carbon strong armored material. Oh, th this article is perfect for you, man. Why, why don't you explain what lithography is first of all? Okay, so for people that don't understand or don't know this, uh, lithography is a form of 3D printing, and I actually worked at a company called Formlabs, which is at the forefront of using this lithography technique in uh, benchtop 3D printing. But what they've been doing in this research, specifically at the Caltech facility, is doing lithography at the nano, nano, nano scale, like very, very small. And the way that lithography works is you take a resin that is a liquid, you know, it some type of polymer that you know it kind of looks like a syrup it's this goopy resin that is, is a liquid at room temperature um and it's photosensitive which means that when light hits it and in this case a very very small laser that's only two photons wide when that light hits it the energy excites the uh liquid resin and it cures into a solid plastic so Basically what they're doing is taking liquid, hitting it with a laser, and it turns into plastic at the tiny spot where the laser hit it. And by doing this with an ultra thin laser, they can change which parts turn to solid and which ones stay liquid. And you can lift the solid out of this vat of liquid and you're left with a solid structure wherever the laser touched. So, so they're doing this to create a super complex geometry of this polymer. Uh, you know, I think they call it a tetrakaidecahedron, which is oh, basically... That is that is a tongue it's twister. It's a tongue twister. Yeah. But if you check our show notes, click the link in the article, you can see a photo of it. It basically looks like a very, very complicated truss structure. So okay. a lot of different beams connected to each other. Um, you know, imagine if you were to create armor out of a lot of little tiny trusses. That's exactly what this is. Okay, so so let, let's follow the path of how this thing is made, right? You do the 3D printing, you pull it out, and now you have a plastic piece of the structure. Then you're taking it and putting it in a furnace. Is that what you said? Yeah. So it's okay. it when it comes out of that printer, you've got plastic. That's mm -hmm. not the super strong material that we want. We want the carbon. Um, we want just the carbon. So what they do is they, you know, this plastic is an organic polymer. So it's based mostly in carbon and hydro and hyd hydrogen and oxygen. So that this organic polymer has three different types of atoms in it, mostly carbon. And what they do is they take it in a vacuum furnace and they heat it up really, really hot. And basically what happens is the hydrogen and the oxygen burn off. So what you're left with is, you know, somewhere between 90 and 99% carbon is left in this structure. So it's, you know, carbon's pretty strong. It's pretty brittle. It would be impossible for you to try and create this structure That's using just say. carbon. Yeah. But when they use this 3D printing method, where they make this truss structure and then they carbonize it after that's what it's called carbonizing when you put it in the oven they can burn off the other parts that make it possible for them to manufacture that way and they get this complex carbon structure that you couldn't otherwise achieve that totally makes sense that that's one of the things i was skeptical about when he started talking i was like huh if they're doing carbon and they want the strength they're probably going at the nano level and if they're doing that manufacturing is not going to be easy but this makes a little bit more sense and so let's talk about the brittle portion right 
it, is it the architecture of this structure that's allowing it to like kind of bounce and absorb some some of the energy of let's say a projectile hitting it yeah exactly so carbon is known for being very very brittle another form of carbon that you know a lot of us are very uh, familiar with is graphite and that's the stuff that's like the lead in your pencil right and if you've ever tried to write with a pencil you know that the lead breaks all too often because it's very very brittle um, but what they managed to do by using this new manufacturing method is instead of making a solid chunk of carbon that's super brittle what they did is they created you know this geometry that's ultra light and it also has just tiny trusses of carbon and that actually makes the overall structure more bendable more resilient than if you were to use a solid chunk of it that you know the way i like to think of it is like um, when it's super, super brittle, a material is super brittle, it's like a tortilla chip. And if you try to put any force on this tortilla chip, it's just going to shatter. But if you use the raw tortilla that's kind of soft and flexible and bendable, you can press on it and it doesn't break. So that's what they've done is they found a way to make this usually super brittle material a little bit more resilient, which makes it great for doing you know the stuff that we want to by you know impact resistance making sure that bullets don't pierce through making sure that if you hit it with a hammer it doesn't break that's exactly what they want to do what what brand of tortillas hurt you so bad that you feel like you had to bring it up is it tostitos <laughs> you want me to call up tostitos and talk to them about it yeah they, well, they just make your you dip know, fall it it's great to have a brittle chip you you bite into it, it cracks it's perfect but um, that's not what you want when you're making bulletproof armor. You don't want it to just I, shatter. So I, I mean, I agree, but I just felt like there was a lot of passion in the tortilla chip segment. All I'm saying. <laughs> but no, that, that actually does sound pretty interesting. So they they, they made this um, structure that they think is going to be very resilient. How are how are they testing a nanostructure to see if it can actually absorb a projectile? Well, so the way that they tested this is actually really, really interesting. And they also came up with an interesting discovery afterwards, so I'm excited to talk about it. Basically, what they did is they made a mini cannon mm -hmm. where they sh shined light behind a tiny projectile and were able to create a ball of plasma that propelled a little, little tiny bullet towards their nano armor. Oh, that's cool. Um, at up to 1,100 cool. meters per second, which is over three times the speed of sound. So, like... Wow. similar energy levels as we're talking as if you were shot at with a bullet from a gun. So they're doing basically s similar to shooting it out of a gun, but they made a very, very nanos nanoscale tiny gun that uses light to propel projectiles. And basically what they found out in their results is at the same scale, you know, for the same weight and at the same size, this carbon armor performed better than any Kevlar does, than any aluminum or steel, the other types of things that we use to armor and protect wow. ourselves. This one's lighter and stronger at, you know, protecting from these nan like little, little tiny particles. So that's incredible. They, wow. they view it as the first step of testing using nanostructures as armor. But what they also have found is a law that might define the way that we test nano armor in the future okay and it actually relates back to this thing called the buckingham pie theorem which i Sounds don't know delicious. you and i took some physics classes some astronomy basically this buckingham pie theorem is an old theorem that's used to predict meteor behavior when it impacts a planet i've, I've so never heard about it basically what it does is it allows people to you know take the mass and the size and the structure of different and the density of different meteors and different planets and predict um, when a meteor hits it at a certain speed whether a chunk of the planet will break off um, basically oh. for us on earth it allows us to predict whether or not a meteor can cause catastrophic failure of our planet or not but what's interesting is they're talking about really really big things right right a huge planet a huge meteor that would able to cause catastrophic failure of the earth but they found that the same principle applies when they're doing this thing at the nanoscale so small that we can't even see it Interesting. They found that the same principle applies. So what they said is, you know, their experiments aligned very strongly with the Buckingham Pi theorem, and now they're able to, you know, predict what certain types of density might work, what different types of geometry might work without av having to actually, you know, warm up and fire off their nano cannon. They can use the Buckingham Pi theorem to do it. So they're hoping that this relationship also proves true for other types of nano engineering in the future. And they were just one of the first ones to recognize it. That, that's really cool. Like they're basically setting a framework for future investigation of nanostructures as, as armoring and shielding. That, that's really fascinating. 